Shall I start? Oh, man, please. <laughs> My God, okay. Um, so first of all, thank you all for four fantastic presentations. Um, everyone in this room will be making their own connections and forming their own thoughts and coming with your own preoccupations, your own interests, and tuning into these presentations and this question in your own way. I've got the job of sharing my version of that. Um, it's all very fresh off the page. I've been scribbling notes and listening and thinking. Um, and I'm not going to try and make sense of any of it. I'm just going to share with you kind of some of the thoughts that are rising to the surface and in relation to the kind of bigger question and the individual contributions. Now that that's moved, I'm going to sit back down. Um, so I'm going to, yeah, I'll share some observations. I'll throw some questions to uh, our speakers, um, and then it will open up to the, to the floor. Um, and I think Lucia and Philippa will keep us all in check, time-wise and question-wise. We're on it. <laughs> so the thoughts that rise to the surface in terms of the presentations, um, and I'll do this in order. So... Um, Phoebe started off talking about the paradigm shift away from the biology of the individual and this idea of looking at recognizing the strangers within us. Um, and you drew a lot on um, Lynn Margulis, and I know she talked about you know, the more you look at things, the closer you look at something, the further away it gets. The more we try to understand something, the, the less there is that we know of it and the more questions that arise from it. I love the idea of terminology that you were using around residency and hosting. Um, what is hosting what at a cellular or organism basis? Um, and I wondered if we could develop an etiquette of cohabitation <laughs> um, with our kind of interspecies ecologies. <clears throat> and I wrote lots of other things. I'm just going to try and pull out a few bits and pieces. Um, for Sabina's talk, um, I really like the idea of the, the scaling, um, kind of trying to operate, understand th these fundamental phenomena, these underlying mechanisms that are driving uh, incredibly complex formation in biological forms like the murmuration of starlings and the flocking of, of um, birds or shoaling of fish. Um, and that these systems have a kind of robustness built in. They are robust to failure. Is a, is a quote that came out. And you talked about designing agents to drive the collective behavior that you desire. I think I got that right. It might not be a verbatim quote. And I thought that was a really good kind of lesson for us to think about. If, if we are trying to, you know, we're working with systems, we're working with processes, how can we try and create or design an agent that drives collective behavior that can uh, engender a positive ecological thinking as we kind of ex you know, expand from individual organisms to thinking about wider planetary issues. From Anais and Germain's talk, um, I love the beginning bit with the, in, with the inaccessible behavior of worms and that you know, worms cannot be seen doing their thing by, by any other organism other than soil microbes perhaps. And I liked the idea of the, the flaneur as an estranged organism roaming the city, not quite um, part of this world, but observing it and being part of it at the same time. And the thing that resonated most with me was, in relation to your own processes, the balance between the soil science and the creative engagement, the performative aspects of alchemy and how you kind of bring that to an audience in the exhibitions, but also the participation that you were working within the communities. So performance and participation, I thought, were very key in terms of how you tell the story of the soil, not only in microbial terms, but culturally and in the kind of significance in how, in how it's working. I hope this is making sense so far. Um, Speaking of sense, <laughs> gets us back on to, to Hannah. Um, the thing that, that resonated was the, the question of the ad ideas of sensory, um, that it's beyond a kind of functional organ, but is very much part of an embedded 
process or series of processes of communication. Um, I now know why I don't like kombucha. <laughs> you said sensing is a visceral property, and you ended by saying that we shouldn't just marvel at, at these discoveries and these behaviours, but think about how we can live better with them. And I think that would be a good kind of start to the, the questions and conversations. That, and you know, we'd heard throughout all the presentations the word process being used a lot, but you really articulated it at the end that it is, life is a metabolic process. Um, and you know, process is the driving force. So how we can live a good process. That's kind of what rose to the surface with me. Does anybody want to comment back on those things? Before I throw a question. So could I ask the speakers how this, an idea of metabolic ethics relates to you? Can, if you were to embrace that concept within your practice, your research, can, can you connect with the idea of a metabolic ethics to live a good process? Would it be possible to get a little bit of a, <clears throat> like a recap on that? Because I may have been grabbing a coffee <laughs> at that moment. Uh, and maybe also just for the, for the context setting, perhaps. I know it was part of your, your Right. Talk. So it's, in, in ethics, uh, one often asks the question of how, how to lead a good life, how to act towards others. Um, I mean, there are many questions of ethics, but they're often around what should we do, how should we live, and how should we act towards others. And in bioethics, it's centered on objects of contemporary biology, those often take very specific forms. So. Um, if we can engineer genes, um, how should we engineer the genes of others? Uh, uh, it's sort of centered on this, this question of control. What should we do with control? Or in terms of neuroethics, you know, what kinds of enhancements or um, uh, supplements or those kinds of things are appropriate? Right. So if we shift it, from the gene or the brain or the embryo mm -hmm. to the process that is metabolism. Metabolism is constant and ongoing and has all kinds of um, operations that are not just about nutrition, but about detoxification and the processing of oxygen. So do you, do, when you, you say you, shift it, do you mean shift, like shift from the gene to the metabolism? Right. Okay. You make metabolism the center of your attention instead of the object. And, and so then you have to ask, what is it to, to have a good process? And when we act towards others, let's say in uh, marketing food, uh, what, what is it to, to foster a process for human flourishing rather than human dysbiosis, for example? So it's just a recentering. It's a, a provocation of, um, but I absolutely don't expect everyone to adopt it immediately either. So, thanks. So, how do you, in, within your research, how do you live a good process, Savina? So the whole aspect of ethics is a, is a real issue in robotics right now because it's on <laughs> everyone's mind. So if you look at Black Mirror, how many of you watch Black Mirror? But, um, yeah. Very often it goes quite we wrong. May have the mic may you might want to hold your microphone oh. a bit closer. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. All right. I was just asking how many of you watch Black Mirror because usually things go terribly wrong and it's the robot's fault or the AI's fault. Um, so there is a huge push in our community to think about robo-ethics or AI ethics. And actually, in the UK, uh, we have one of the first British, uh, well, the first standards in roboethics. Um, these are not typically designed for swarm robotics. And so we are also very mindful of designing robot ecosystems uh, that behave in an ethical way. 
Uh, and that requires us to do a lot of research of actually what is the emergent behavior of this ecosystem, which is not an obvious thing to do. Uh, so so we, are, we are very mindful of that. People are pushing for, for very strong robo-ethics, and, and there is a research component to understand these ecosystems uh, around that. So. I think um, what comes to my mind, does that, can you hear that yeah. clearly? Okay. What comes to my mind is um, I used to run a think tank in, in kind of food and farming and, and consulting um, restaurants and farmers on, on you know, where they source their food and that kind of thing. Um, and part of what we discovered there was like looking at gluten intolerance, for example. You know, people are wondering why gluten intolerance is increasing. Um, and there's a correlation between, you know, our wheat, our grains um, grow in soils that have complex uh, microbiomes of their own. And when we put food into our bodies, that impacts our, our own microbiomes. And so with all of the chemicals and fertilizers and things that we're treating our grains with, we're actually killing uh, soil microbiomes, which then is impacting our microbiomes in our bodies. So I guess if I'm thinking about metabolic ethics, uh, it makes me think of like, of um, thinking of, instead of just human ethics of, you know, we should or shouldn't treat humans in this way, you could think of it like we shouldn't treat the human continuous metabolism, which includes bacteria, which includes fungi, you know, what, what does like a extended metabolic ethics look like? And then, you know, where would Monsanto stand on that? That's what comes to mind. Do we have anyone from Monsanto here today that would like to answer that? Please just be here. I can't wait to meet you. That would be good. Ensure <laughs> yourself. For reasons that I, <laughs> I won't say why. Would you like to, do you have something to answer? Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe not with a, I mean, I don't have a scientific background to respond to this, but uh, through our work and our method of uh, inquiry, we're really focusing at looking at how and trying to understand how we arrive to this separation with our milieus of life and developing processes through this inquiry, through developing this new attention to these things inside our bodies, but I mean, in the soils, in this world around us that is being quite invisible or not having a lot of attention paid to it and trying to weave with some, some mingling relation to it. Mm. Yeah, I guess this question about uh, the process is, once you look at the process, of course, you always look at all the things that evacuate it. It's, it's always more than one thing, of course. It's multi-species, multi-substance. And I guess the, the big question for me would be, how do you register for all these things that participate in it and therefore all the things that you should be pa paying attention to? It's a kind of a core building of sustainability, if you want. And uh, yeah, it, I guess my sort of temporary response has been doing this kind of shared work across arts, science, mm. and, and the arts for now. Because yeah. what's clearly apparent is it's a messy area in terms of research. We, you know, we, we are dealing with kind of liminal spaces between you know, them and us, it and another it. Um, that it's very difficult to be reductionistic. It is incredibly complex, multiple things interrelating in dynamic systems. So the next question is, can the modern scientific method cope with that? And how does scientific research have to change, or how should it change, to embrace that complexity more? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Well, there, there, there's a good example of that in the field of, of machine learning, and that is deep neural networks. Um, so we're increasingly using very complex systems uh, to make computer programs more and more intelligent. And as a result of that, these complex systems are sometimes difficult to understand. Uh, and on the back of that, there's been a push to make tools, so better scientific tools, to be able to deal with this complexity so that we can make what currently looks like a black box uh, explainable uh, or understandable. And actually, we're taking back from the field of neuroscience and how you probe neurons to try to understand these artificial neural systems. So it is very interesting to see how we can create more and more complex models, and we have to create better and better scientific tools to understand them. Um, but I think we can cope. Uh, they're just continuously evolving research questions. 
And is there any kind of feedback from the machine learning and the, and the research done in that sector back into biological research? Yeah, Does there anyone there is, yeah. So, so for example, when they probed some of these artificial neural networks, they, they, they saw that some of these neurons could represent lines, and that is something that they had as a parallel in the brain as well. So there's, there's interesting hypotheses that are generated through these artificial systems as well. Uh, and we see this in swarming too. So sometimes we have emergent behaviors that, um, that we hadn't expected, and we can go back and ask biologists if this is something that they observed. So, so there's a, a feedback loop between the, what is observed in biological organisms that's applied to the models and then fed back into the biological. So there's kind of dialogue between the I biological and the, the models. Ideally. You know? It doesn't always happen. Uh, sometimes we just take inspiration. Uh, but we do, we do discover interesting things that hopefully are useful for biologists as well. And does it, others have thoughts on the, the shift from the mechanistic to the more kind of holistic and, and interconnected. How research methodologies do you think should, should change to adapt to that paradigm shift? Mm. I'm not sure how I would answer for, for the, the natural sciences because I, I wasn't trained in that field. But for, for anthropology, certainly, I think we gain a lot in actually just expanding the way we do field work. Basic, you know, when you do field work with anthropology, the point is of learning to be affected by the capital of lives of the people you're doing field work with. And why not just expand this to how also all the beings live and uh, how materials travel in the world and then also looking at how scientists learn to be affected by these things because they also do. And lots of people in the science and technology studies are doing that at the moment. I think it's a really good path for opening this up. And I'm not saying all anthropologists should be doing this, but on these kind of topics, it's probably a promising way, yes, I think. I, I can definitely weigh in from having been trained in um, like reductionist Cambridge natural sciences, and then you know, now I'm teaching at this holistic uh, alternative university. And, and um, I think we're seeing a lot of new departments in like in complexity or dynamic systems or systems thinking, you know, like a lot is happening and has been happening over the last you know, couple of decades. But I do think that uh, what I think we need to see more of is training scientists in seeing the world in a different way. So how do you actually train the young scientific mind and systems thinking, not just studying systems thinking, but actually how do I see the world? How do I interrogate the natural world? How do I, um, even just the way you design experiments, like we're, we're, trained to, um, we're trained to design experiments in a very reductionist way. And, and there are very different ways of thinking that I think leads to very different science. Um, you know, and when I think of my undergraduate, I only learned about Darwin. I never learned about, um, you know, I don't think we covered, we didn't cover alternatives or, or even putting uh, the scientific method and the history of science into context for scientists would do a lot because then we can see, you know, how did sci how was science born? What was the enlightenment? Why, you know, why did we see the world in that way? And why has economics been built on this Darwinian way of seeing the world, I think that's all relevant to, yeah, to changing the way scientists behave. You were nodding, and Hannah, do you want to add I'll, to that? I'll pick up on the pedagogical strain because um, at, at UCLA, one of the things that, that I've done is to help found and run this new major, which is a life science major called Human Biology and Society. What? And the content is, is very much um, uh, recognizable, the students take the life science core, um, but they are also um, given courses called things like ways of knowing. So you have to understand how, how things are known in different disciplines and understand what those have to do with one another. And, and that's a kind of life skill for a scientist. I often joke that we're micro-dosing them with reflexivity, right? <laughs> and and <laughs> gradually over time, they become different kinds of thinkers. And, you know, I teach the introductory course to the major, and it has lots of life science content in it. They learn um, about antibiotic resistance, um, because that's a really good example of 
how a non-reflexive command and control narrative just just didn't take account and, and in fact ignored many signs of, of resistance over many years. Um, and I opened that course by not by teaching about microbes, but by making them read uh, The Island of Dr. Moreau. And then they have an exam in which they have to tell me what the definition of hubris is, right? And so learning what hubris is, is actually just as important as learning what horizontal gene transfer is. You know, learning about natural selection and uh, different uh, chemical structure of antibiotics is just as important as learning the political economy of antibiotics as growth promoters. You know, so it's a principle of equivalence that that these things are things to be known together. And that reflexivity, building reflexivity into practice makes for, a, makes for a science that is actually able to accommodate more mess, I would say. Yes, I would agree. That's ama Should amazing to hear about that in a mainstream institute. That's really cool. Let's open it up to the floor. Um, you can't actually see. There are lots you of hands. Over there. Uh, who's got there's, a mic? Oh, there's there. one here, yeah, that just next to you, there's someone there. Yes, we are Probably being blinded. Right. <laughs> oh, sorry. Right. No, no, no. <laughs> we're all <laughs> we were both like pointing. <laughs> I'm sorry. Hi, thanks so much. That was a really fascinating um, set of papers. I, I think it worked really well together, and I'm, I'm particularly enlivened by how researchers and scholars uh, and artists, uh, thinkers working in such diverse fields are able to nevertheless converge on this core attunement to uh, entanglements, to interspecies cooperations, and, and bring forth the re these realities that are, um, you know, really have been hidden away from us by narratives we thought are central to ourselves as modern beings, whatever. Um, but I wondered how you might present your research uh, and your attunement, which has a sort of almost spiritual uh, sensibility to it, how you might present it to an audience that might not be as receptive as we are. How might you present it to an audience that might think, oh, what you're saying is really weird. Um, we don't trust scientists, or I'm a fundamentalist Christian. In other words, what scope is there for diplomacy um, and how do you see your work? What would need to happen for your work to uh, engage an audience that is as big as possible? Um, and I think that's a worthwhile question because the issues that you're raising have planetary importance, so we should probably aim to engage as big and large audiences as possible. Thank you. Well, I'd be happy to take that on. I think that no matter what kind of audience one has, you can learn what is at stake for them in listening to you. And so if you take an audience of fundamentalist Christians, I mean, they're probably going to care about cancer rates in their families as much as anybody else, right? And if what you're telling them about has, has relevance to thinking about New, new ways to live well in the world that perhaps are within their own, their own power to understand and to, to cope with. You can, you, can always, you can always find out what matters and speak, and speak to that. It doesn't, doesn't have to be in highly technical language. It doesn't have to be um, about artistic practice in some abstract sense. The, there's, there's a way of finding out what's at stake is, I think, the key to the variegation of how, how, the, how the story matters to people. Yeah, I think we all have a role in code, what I like to call code switching. It like, really depends which audience you're talking to about this work. So. I don't think I would guide a meditation for a load of like government officials necessarily, but when I go and teach at this alternative university, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, like there's a spectrum. And I think everybody in this, in this 
I guess when you're working in a paradigm that's shifting, you need to be careful how much uh, you push into that new paradigm um, and, and, yeah, code switch according to who you're talking to. Uh, the, the, the little thing I find a bit maybe problematic with the, uh, this idea that can be with uh, engaging an, an audience or impact or is that it looks as if you were trying to get a message across and I think that's something we, we, we don't really want to do. We may be bringing a message at the beginning, but uh, we're trying to learn also from and with the people we, we're working with uh, rather than trying to get them to, to think in a certain way and enriching our own system in a way as well. But when you do that in the end, you realize that you can talk to people a lot and you multiply the, the kind of uh, things you can discuss with them, including the kind of things that we've been talking here that become maybe more acceptable as well. But it's, it's like a side result, I would say. Yeah, in fact, uh, most of uh, the investigation or the inquiry are involving people where we go in the city and we walk and it's not this uh, scientific uh, mediation, but uh, we are engaging all process with them. We're discovering and you know, observing these stories with them and learning things with them. And it becomes, uh, in fact, a, a collaboration also with uh, these participants. And this, this world is being made uh, in a collective way. I think we also need good examples of how this is being used in the real world and how it really impacts people in their everyday lives. So w one of the challenges we have in, in swarm robotics is that I, I can tell them how this would be useful in the future, but they don't experience it for themselves. Uh, and so I think that's something where we need, we need to show a clear impact, whether it's autonomous cars and having all these cars work together in a smart way or, or the biomedical aspects with nanomedicine. Um, but without examples, all of this still seems quite abstract for people. Okay, thank you. Uh, you can, can I make a suggestion? Sorry, since yeah. you asked me to be the bad yeah. cop, um, that we take like more than one because I'm conscious yeah. that yeah. we're going to have to. Yeah. We'll take a couple from either side. Philippa has a. That's Anna there. Oh, That's Anna. Because. Anna. <laughs> Anna Ting. Microphone is. I think uh, I, before it went off in just vague general. Uh, kinds of issues. I think we had amazing empirical material here, and particularly a set of papers that address the relationship between microbial uh, uh, forms of life and what I had learned to think of as multicellular organisms, but maybe that's a mistake now I see too. And so I have a trio of questions that tries to bring the details back into the conversation. And it starts with a question for Jermaine and Anais about uh, the smell of soils. Uh, because I think at least a lot of the smell of soils is coming from microbes and fungi and lichens. And in my experience, if you put a drop of water on a fungus or lichen that's dry, you'll get a burst of odor. But if you put it in a glass of water, you won't get any odor at all. And so that my question is a straight up empirical thing. If you're going to boil and distill, are you perhaps losing the most important part of the odors produced by those live organisms that are a part of the soil? But let, uh, so it's a part of a a set of questions about this microbial uh, conversation to, uh, to add to Hannah's amazing uh, evocation of the ability of human cells to pick up on microbial byproducts. Uh, do microbes have receptors that work in the other direction that they're uh, getting chemical senses? Is this a system of communication that works in both directions? And then. Uh, Going back to the first talk, uh, Phoebe, uh, I wanted to ask if the communication between um, mitochondria and nuclei inside the cell that you so beautifully and dramatically diagrammed, uh, is, are there uh, chemical receptors inside the cell that are also uh, promoting uh, these kinds of communications? Can I just clarify the question? Are there chemical receptors inside the human cell? Not necessarily human. It doesn't matter if it's human. That you were in any animal cell that has mitochondria nuclei, you were arguing uh, very beautifully that there's many kinds of communication between the nucleus 
um, uh, and of course the cytoplasm more generally, but all those little diagrams that you put up there were mainly about kinds of communication between the nucleus and the mitochondria. And if you would put that in this system of communications that's been evoked by other speakers, or if it's just really a set, a different set of communic a different set of ways of interacting that don't fit in that. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so just to say about this uh, or installation and uh, yes, effectively you making it disappear. We have to say we never found this petrichor, uh, like alchemy, which never found the ether or the goal he was looking for. Its main promise remains unrealized. But along the way, you become attentive through all these things that you've tried to register to make to to look for something. Um, do you want to? In fact, in the, some of the samples. I think we've uh, still managed to uh, extract something that is uh, really close to uh, this fungi or this uh, world of the living you can find sometime uh, in the forest or uh, in cave in this really humid environment. But in fact, uh, I would like to go back to this specific smell of the petrichor, which in fact really happens with this meeting of the, this drop of water falling on the dry soil, liberating some little molecules on the soil and then yeah, meeting with the air. And in fact, this is exactly what the urbanists in the 19th century tried to avoid, criteri like creating a separation between the air, uh, the water, and the soil. But the soil of cities still smell. Yes. Mm. But, but is, is it just the water that's liberating it, or might the fungus or bacteria? Yeah. So it's, it's in the interplay between the bacterial life the water, the splash of the water, which vaporizes in a way, but also people who maybe know what to look for. That's in these different things that we've tried to situate it. Have we got time to take any other questions? Well, we still have. Because I know there are lots of other hands up. I think, I think there's, there's still, yeah. we still have a question. I think there's still two of Anna's burning questions. So I'll answer really fast, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'll try and answer fast. I think from what I understood you were asking, um, I'm going to just answer to what I think your question was. And if I'm, if I'm off, then please just speak again. Um, so yeah, yes. Basically, I would say yes. So when the mitochondria, which used to be a bacteria, was engulfed, um, you know, there's, there has been a lot of communication between, between the two to allow that integration to happen, you know, like we don't have live bacteria living <coughs> inside, um, but well, they shouldn't be living inside our cells. So to go from being a bacteria to be a mitochondria, there was all sorts of communication. And actually, I think it's um, I think it's about 3,000 genes uh, in free living bacteria, like our mitochondria. You see, like 3,000 genes, and now they have 250 genes. Um, left. So actually that's like 2,750 genes have migrated into our nuclei over uh, billions of years. Uh, but the mitochondria still has its own loop of DNA and actually that's how Lynn Margulis was able to prove that um, they, they used to be free living bacteria because she compared that little loop of DNA that's left over to free living bacterial DNA. Um, and then just to, to give you an idea of like the complexity that had to evolve from there, once the genes moved into the nucleus, we had to evolve um, ways to transport the proteins from that nucleus into, back into the mitochondria. So there's been so much complexity that was needed to, and so much communication that needed to make that happen. Um, but the gains were very big because to evolve something as complex as a mitochondria from scratch would take a lot of um, evolutionary novelty. So it was great that we could just steal that. I would say we try and take three of your best. One, two. Here. So Fergus, over here. So three quick Thank questions, you. and then we'll get responses. Is it working? Oh, yeah. Well. <laughs> Um, so very quickly, thank you for the really beautiful and wonderful presentations. I wanted to ask in the spirit of the sort of uh, swarm mentality, um, how an artist working uh, to communicate or to help encourage a sort of ecological thinking that a lot of these 
new developments and the scientists have expressed, have found, how can that be re-communicated in a way that can start to shape um, our ethics, our metaphysics as a community, and what role artists can play in that. So maybe that's a question for Anais, but it could be for anyone. And start that kind of swarm of ecological thinking. Thanks. Okay, so what role can artists play? Let's take another question. Fergus, are you still? Oh. <laughs> I can You're see there. a hand there and a hand oh, there. Um, hi. Thanks for the great talks. Um, mine is not a really quick question. <laughs> Can I ask it anyway? Try your best. Try. <laughs> okay. So, if we look up individual in the dictionary, it ends up with telling us it's a singularity and it's something that's unique and different from everything else. But we've seen until now that the connections between organisms are what make organisms. So. Do we need to work on a new definition of individual? That was quite short. Thank you. <laughs> new definition of individual. And then there was one in that kind of direction there. If we can get the mic to, to that person there. And then you can just take whatever questions you want. Uh, this is a question for Hannah Landecker. Um, there was one slide um, that showed um, an article um, where a synthetic uh, smell of sandalwood helped uh, to heal wounds. And I wondered if that's because of um, sort of molecules in whatever vapor you're smelling, or I don't know how these things work, but essentially is it um, what's in that thing you're smelling, or is it the sense of it? What I mean is, have they replicated this with anosmic people, um, people who can't smell, and, and would that have the same um, effect? Shall we both go back? Should I just time? answer that? Yeah. yeah, I think if you want to take that, and then right. we'll go along the panel, and you can pick up on what role artists play and new definitions of the individual. So um, you're still being too nose-centric. It's not that wound healing happens because someone smells something through their nose. That was an experiment with um, epithelial cells exposed to an, an odorant, which we don't think of smells as being physical, but it is actually a molecule of the thing that is picked up by the receptor. So these skin cells have receptors that were triggered by this odorant, which then caused a cascade of reactions, one of which was to accelerate wound healing. So what is it that's doing the smelling? It's, it's, it's the skin, right? And, and the skin actually also has light receptors in it. And this is what I was talking about, this sort of cracking of our our categories of sense. We think of sense as being in the sense organs, but th then it turns out that the skin is a complicated sense organ. And this sense of uh, chemo reception is perhaps a more democratic way to think about it, that, that all cells are, um, including bacteria and us, and even thinking about some things as communication molecules and other things as nutrients, that too is our invention of categories for things that, that uh, the, way, uh, the way organisms and cells live is in constant sensory attention to the biochemical milieu inside them and outside them. So that slide was really meant to be j just yet another example of how sensing happens um, all kinds of places other than the nose. So obviously, yes, a person who is not good at smelling through their nose could still be chemo sensing in all of those other ways. Thank you. The discussion about redefining individual. Um, so, so on the work with the flocking robots, I actually described it in this paper as all the robots behaving as if they were a single, uh, a single entity. 
Uh, and I didn't describe this, but we did a lot of work on how you do artificial evolution to automatically come up with systems where robots work together in a cooperative fashion. Uh, and it turns out that there's conditions that lead to cooperation and basically to these systems behaving as a single individual because they have an incentive to do so. So for example, having these collectives have a common goal, uh, having these collectives have similar DNA, in our case it's artificial DNA. Uh, and so it'd be interesting to redefine individual as, as a group of things that are working together towards a common, a common goal, but that's me just winging it. So. So I, I was also thinking about the question on the individual, um, and I think what I come to is I don't think we should redefine the word individual. I think we should just stop defining ourselves as individuals. Um, if you think about it, like if we were to be scientifically accurate introducing ourselves, you could be like, hi, I'm 90% bacteria and 10% human, or, you know, this is Phoebe, but like, we could stop thinking of, of individual being um, this fixed. Yeah, I don't think we, we need to redefine the word individual. I just think we are not individuals. We are webs, we are interactions, we are multitudes. Um, and we always have been. And actually, we're so um, trained to you know, pick out the individual things or details or objects and actually like neurologically um, you know we're wired to like in our neural circuits in our vision um, there's a thing called surround inhibition which means that we actually like visually pick out objects and, and edges so I think maybe we as humans aren't wired to see the world exactly as it is but if you talk to like a quantum physicist they're much more um, they've done some rewiring on their brain where they can really see that everything is moving, everything is inter interactive, or maybe you need to talk to people um, you know, on LSD or, or something. There are different ways, I think, that we can actually rewire our, our, the way of seeing the world to actually see the way it is. I would also add that, that the answer to that question is also perhaps the answer to the question about what, what can artists do or do with this kind of stuff. Um, and yeah. so I would say that being an individual is a process, not a, not a thing. Um, and, and the playfulness around um, helping people access that way of thinking, sometimes it's easier to think it through a sculpture than a pharmaceutical, right? It might be... Um, easier to think it through different modes of representation. I mean, when you give that answer, I think immediately of Greg Bear's classic novel, Blood Music, where, uh, where humans kind of go down the sink. <laughs> they fall into their cells and, and go down the sink, and you get this sort of um, mass of cells coding the world. And when I teach, it's always easier to teach with that than, or teach with that coupled with a scientific paper so that you can access the same thing from lots of different representational points of view. And, and it opens out a, a possibility for play rather than being anxious about whether or not you have the right definition. I think, I think artists have a very big place to, like a big, big role to play. And I want to see also more artists like directly interacting with research. So more artists reading papers and using actual scientific papers as inspiration for art instead of just ideas of, you know, um, often I find art can be a bit more uh, tending towards the imaginative, which is, also, which is also fantastic. But I'd love to see artists like directly um, using scientific material and playing with that, because we need that. Yeah, I think we can, uh, as artists, uh, working with, uh, in an interdisciplinary way, we can go further to communication or even just taking science as an inspiration. But what I'm really interested in my practice is to collaborate. And this means, you know, like really taking time to shape, uh, you know, something together and from this, uh, start to imagine to, and to experiment and to all embody these other ways of uh, being to the world, of being affected, of relating to others uh, through all different practice. But 
also relating to others as these other beings in our milieus of life. So it's, you know, like really shaping this thing together and creating a common imaginary to build uh, new possibilities in a common way. Which I think is a beautiful place to leave it, okay. to build common imaginaries. So thank you very much to all the speakers. Thank you thank for your you. questions. Thank you.